Hey there, my name is Charles, and in this series, we'll be using Unity to implement the core system from Red Dead Redemption 2. By watching this series, you'll get a first-hand look at the process that I use to develop games, and hopefully, you'll pick up some tips and tricks to use along the way. Now, before we get started, we'll need to understand exactly what we'll be developing. So, let's take a moment to do that now. In Red Dead Redemption 2, the player has three stats to keep track of. Health, Stamina, and Deadeye. Each stat is represented by a core. A core consists of two meters, an icon and a ring. The ring meter indicates how much of a particular stat is remaining, and the icon meter indicates how fast that stat will regenerate. The ring depletes when a stat is used, while the icon depletes continuously over time. And that's the basic gist of the core system. There is of course more to it, but this should be enough information to get us underway. Now, if you've been following my channel for a while, then you might have deja vu right now. I've actually done a series on the health bar from Zelda Breath of the Wild. However, in that series, I focus on demonstrating test-driven development, whereas in this one, I'll focus on my general game development process. All right, enough talk. Let's get to work. We're gonna start off by reading a few user stories that I've written for this project. Now, I'm a very process-oriented person, both professionally and personally and user stories are an important part of a process that I like to follow called Scrum. I won't be covering Scrum or user stories in detail during this series, but don't worry. All you need to know is that a user story describes a piece of functionality that must be implemented. Each user story is written from the perspective of a user and describes the value that it'll provide. If you're interested in learning more about how I apply Scrum to game development, let me know in the comments. If enough people are interested, I'd be happy to make some videos about it. Let's read a couple of these user stories so we can get a feel for the effort. As a player who wants to focus on combat, I want Arthur's health ring to regenerate based on the value of his health core so that he can survive longer without using consumables. Arthur is the protagonist of Red Dead Redemption 2, in case you didn't know. And this user story describes a combat-oriented player who'd like his health to regenerate over time so they can focus on combat. As a player who enjoys immersive games, I want Arthur's health core to deplete over time so that I have incentive to make him sleep and eat. This user story describes a different type of player who finds value in immersiveness. If this is your first time reading user stories, then hopefully you're beginning to get the idea. They simply describe some functionality in terms of the value that it'll bring to the user. Let's check out the user story that we'll be tackling in this video. As a player, I want to see Arthur's health core and ring on my HUD so that I can monitor his health during combat. I've fleshed this story out a little more than the others by adding acceptance criteria and a picture for reference. Acceptance criteria is another part of the Scrum methodology. It basically describes what needs to happen in order for us to mark the user story as done. A white ring should be used to display Arthur's current health to the player. The unfilled section should reflect Arthur's max health and should be clearly visible. A heart should be used to display the current value of Arthur's health core. All right, let's switch on over to Unity and get started. Now, at this point, I do some research, whiteboard and implementation, and prepare any assets needed in order to complete this ticket. And that's exactly what I've done. I've gone ahead and imported a sprite sheet into the project and laid out the basic hierarchy for the core UI in the scene. I've also done some research and have a pretty good idea about how I'm going to write this functionality. Each one of these UI elements has an image component that allows it to be rendered in the scene. The image class exposes a type property that, when set to filled, enables us to display a portion of the image in a couple of different ways. I've set the icon meter image to fill vertically from the bottom, and the ring meter image to fill radially from the top. All our code will need to do now is manipulate the value of fill amount. So let's go ahead and create a class to do this. I'm going to call it core UI and add it to the game object that's directly above the core images in the hierarchy. The first thing we need to do is add an image and float field for each element in the core UI. I want to make sure that the images can only be set from the editor, so I'll make those private and mark them with the serialized field attribute. And I'll make the floats public because we'll need to be able to manipulate them from elsewhere in the code later. Next, 
I'm going to add an update method that sets each image's fill using its corresponding float value. Now, let's hop back over to the editor. Hit play, and test it out. Beautiful. Everything works, and this ticket is functionally complete. But I'm not quite satisfied. The Scrum methodology has this concept called definition of done. It basically just lays out everything that needs to be completed before you can close a user story. Now, you may be thinking, wait, isn't that what the acceptance criteria is for? Well, the definition of done encompasses more than just functionality. It also includes all of the meta tasks that need to be completed as well. Think unit tests, code reviews, documentation, database changes, and any other logistical tasks that need to be taken care of. In our case, I want to write a unit test for this behavior. So let's hop back into the code editor. Now, the code we've written is fine, but as I re-examine it with testability in mind, two things jump out at me. First, I won't be able to initialize the images from within a unit test because they're private. And second, this duplication here kind of makes me feel funny. I may be taking it too literal, but this code actually breaks the rule of three. This same statement is essentially repeated three times here. So I think we can go ahead and refactor the functionality out into its own class. Let's go ahead and create a mono behavior called image fill setter. The name may seem a little on the nose, but it encapsulates exactly what this mono behavior is going to be responsible for. And if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, well, you get the idea. So let's add a private image field that's exposed in the editor and a public float field. And just like before, we'll set the image fill value in the update method. Now, since this mono behavior will only have the one image, we can actually go ahead and mark it with the require component attribute and pass in the type of the image class. With that in place, we can now initialize the image field from the awake method and remove it from the editor. This inadvertently solves the challenge that we were facing before of how to initialize the image value from within our unit test. I love it when that happens. Let's hop back into Unity and update the UI. Beautiful. Works like a charm. So we're almost ready to write that unit test, but there's just one last thing I want to change. See, I've been exploring data-driven development a lot lately, and if you've seen Ryan Hipple's game architecture talk, then you may already know where this is headed. Based on how we wrote it, the only way to programmatically update the core's UI is by having a reference to the image fill setter class. But I don't really want to expose such a generic object to the rest of my code. It'll definitely throw me for a loop 16 months into development when some unrelated bug is manifesting itself in the UI. No, what I really want is to encapsulate that value so I can focus on manipulating the data rather than the object itself. Let's hop back into the editor one more time so I can show you what I mean. Let's make this float value a first class citizen by creating a class called float value. Now we can use that to set the image fill instead. All we need to do is add an implicit cast so our original code doesn't break. Much better. But I still want to be able to set this value from the editor, so let's make float value a scriptable object and mark it with the create asset menu attribute. 
Now we can create a float value asset to hold the value for each of our meters. Let's do that now. I'll create one for the icon meter, the ring background, and just the ring. And again, works like a charm. Now it's time to write that unit test. But I think I'll save that bit of code for my tier two patrons. Don't worry though, all of the code you've seen in this video so far is available for download free of charge on my Patreon page. But if you're interested in checking out the unit tests for this behavior or supporting my channel, then please consider becoming a tier two patron today. All right, that's it for part one. I think we can officially call this user story completed. In the next video, we'll press on and continue to knock out more functionality. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and a comment letting me know what you thought. And for more Unity videos and tutorials just like this one, don't forget to subscribe with notifications on. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you to all of my patrons, and a special shout out to NZ, Richard Stance, Sean Carey, Thomas, Willandingo, and Yagov.